I'm here with Alexander Merkurs, editor in chief of the Durant. Alexander, let's uh, dig into the Jeffrey Epstein story. We've been uh, covering it pretty well here. Got a couple of videos up on it, and uh, I want to do this video with you because I want to take a look at the the legal side of what's going on here. Um, it's in the Southern District of New York now. The case it was it was settled in Florida, but now it's resurfaced in New York. Um, what do you make of, of of what's happening here, Alexander, with this case? Purely from a legal standpoint, the fact that it is being handled by the SDNY, the fact that uh, you had the Labor Secretary Alex Acosta, who's the Labor Secretary of the Trump White House, was the person who in Florida brokered the deal with uh, with Epstein, a deal that was, for all intents and purposes, a sweetheart deal. Um, you know, he said seven days, seven, six days of the week, six of the seven days, he was able to leave the this country club prison, you know, at will. And um, now he's in New York. They're, I, I think right now they're discussing the, the, the bail, if they're going to even give him any bail because he has a flight risk, obviously, yeah. being a billionaire, yeah. and he has the capacity to to leave the country. Well, what, what do you make of everything that's happening here from a legal perspective? Right. Well, first of all, the fact that he's been refused, if he's going to be refused bail, I think that's entirely correct because he clearly is a flight risk. The fact that it's been transferred to a different uh, uh, jurisdiction, uh, I, I can see some logic in that. But I have to say, I don't fully understand why it has to be the Southern District of New York. And the problem with these cases is that it's always very difficult to separate, as one should, the legal aspect of the case from the political aspect of the case. And the problem with the Epstein, Epstein affair is that um, each side in this very polarized country, which is what the United States has now become, um, is very anxious to try to make this either a uh, Democrat stroke Clinton scandal or a Republican stroke Trump scandal. Now, from what I have seen, Epstein's links were very, very much with Clinton and the Democrats. I don't really see that the connection with Trump is a very strong one. And if it's true that Trump threw him out of his uh, uh, Mar-a-Lago club, which I've heard it is, then that rather reinforces the view that Trump really wasn't involved and strongly disapproved of what he was doing. But the trouble is that the Southern District of New York is a section of the U.S. federal judicial and prosecutorial system, which has consistently been very hostile to Donald Trump. It was where um, Donald Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen, was prosecuted. Um, um, Mueller, Robert Mueller, has worked very closely with the attorneys there. And, of course, one has to worry that it's been transferred there, basically, in order to keep Clinton, the Clintons and the Democrats out of trouble and to transfer it all to the Republicans and Donald Trump by playing up Donald Trump's side of it, which, as I said, doesn't seem to me on the facts that I've seen at all substantial, whilst downplaying what, you know, the Clinton connection. So that's, that's my concern. I, I cannot see why it would have to be in that particular district as opposed to any other. Yeah, I think the tragedy in all of this is that this is – Moving and, and obviously the political part is because you know we we're focusing on geopolitics and politics this is what yes. this channel does. Yes. But obviously the human tragedy in this is is devastating. Absolutely. And, and what what this guy and the people he's associated with because they say he has a network. No one is really talking about who that network is, who's behind him, how this guy made his money. You know, what's what's really going on? What's this guy's infrastructure like? What's this guy's history like? Because not many people are really, really understand it no. and how this guy came to his billions. But there's a there's a definite human, a terrible human tragedy here. 
but the polit the political side of it is what's you know being talked about because as you said you're you're dealing with a very polarized america and they're and both sides are trying to to score points here i i think it, i think that is all all absolutely correct and can i say one of the most interesting aspects of the epstein story epstein story is that it's not been covered very extensively in britain and in the european media and i can't help but think that the reason that is so is because people are very nervous about it here they sense that there is something really big behind all of this and first of all you're absolutely right one must not ignore the huge suffering that there is at the bottom of all of this i mean the trafficking the abuse of um, underage uh, 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 women, uh, uh, girls. I mean, shocking. But if there is a ring of people involved, and if Epstein is at the center of this ring, and if it extends beyond him and includes lots of people in the political system in the United States, that political system has very intimate connections with the political system here in Europe. And one does wonder whether lots of people in Europe might not be involved in it also in some ways. And that may explain the extraordinary reticence of the European media in covering this story. At least that's my impression. Well, we already know that there are some connections, at least from the flight logs. We know that uh, Prince Andrew, uh, Prince Andrew, I believe, yes, was, yeah. was one of the people that was, you know, well, the, trotting this is around the globe with Epstein on this quote unquote Lolita Express airplane. So, I mean, you know, you're, well, this, you're touching the royal a, family, aren't you? Absolutely. Of course you are. I mean, he is the second son of the queen. So that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. I mean, that's, I suspect why, as I said, the British media, especially are barely touching this. I mean, what, what you have just said has not been reported here and it would be explosive. If um, it were, I mean, I, I, I want to make it very clear at this point, I'm not making any allegations against any individual person, including the one you've just named. No. But the mere fact that he was in any way connected with Epstein would be a very, very serious matter. And I would remind people who watch this program that, of course, when there have been other uh, uh, cases of a similar sort, well, not of a similar sort, but other cases, uh, people have not hesitated to indulge in, get, in guilt by Kavanaugh. association. Indeed, exactly, guilt by so. association. So, you know, uh, one, one can easily see how that could ha start to take off in a big way here. So, you know, we, we need to keep a very careful track on this, but it does have a very sinister feel. It does look as if um, we're looking at some sort of establishment ring involving, you know, gross activities and also some kind of establishment cover up also, quite possibly. And that may be signaled by the fact, as I said, that this case has been transferred to the Southern District of New York, which is a very politicized legal district has been very politicized and where I think you just told me before we started on this program that James Comey's daughter yes, Maureen is, Comey. Is, is is herself um, either herself a federal prosecutor or is involved yeah. in in the uh, um, aspects of prosecution there so all of that makes one feel that this affair this uh, um, this scandal is being handled in a very careful way to protect some people and damage others. Going on the Maureen Comey thing, um, the fact that she's a prosecutor there. How how are these cases, in your experience and what you know, um, obviously you're the UK law, but what you know of the the US law. How how do you think th how are these things usually prosecuted? Are these long cases? Do you think there's going to be a long, draw, drawn out kind of process? Are these things usually handled with a, with a plea deal? You know, there's there's people saying that he pled. Well, actually, there's people. There's fact is he's pled not guilty. 
And there are people saying that he's looking to cut a deal. But my mind kind of, you know, I, I step back and I say, what deal can this guy cut? I mean, it's all there in the in the flight logs, is it not? Are there not witnesses to all this? I mean, Peter Lavelle on the live stream that we did, when we were talking about this. He made the, the point. I mean, you know, don't you have staff? Don't you have security? Don't you have people that are witness to what was happening? I mean, there are people that say, that were working on the airplane that say, you know, or accompanied Epstein on the airplane that said he was always, you know, chaperoned with, you know, two or three very young women as he was getting on, on this, on this plane. I mean, there's, there's witnesses to all of this. So what I kind of deal is there to make unless there is a big network or some sort of network propping him up, working with him outside of, of this no. this one guy hedge fund called well, Jeffrey this, Epstein. Yes. Well, there shouldn't be a deal. I mean, that's the first thing to say. I mean, I, I think any deal would be wholly inappropriate. I mean, uh, um, in the United States, in my opinion, uses plea bargaining far too much. It, it, it's, in fact, wrecked havoc across the, the criminal justice system in the U.S. Uh, with a lot, an awful lot of people pressured into accepting uh, uh, and making guilty pleas on what they think are lesser offences as a way of, you know, basically saving money to the system and getting the conviction rate up, and in a way which I think is completely inappropriate because, as I said, it means that a lot of people who might properly have pleaded not guilty are pressured into pleading guilty. But in this particular case, there is a huge public interest in not settling this through a plea bargain, because you really need proper truth and transparency in this sort of case. I mean, we're dealing here with apparently lots of victims, and I mean, victims of what looks like the most sinister type of criminal activity, and they deserve justice by having this thing exposed. Do, do they but, come in, in these types of cases? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Alexander, but before I forget, it's late at night and I want to make sure I don't forget. Do these, do, are these people called in by the prosecutor's office? Do they voluntarily come? How, how, how does this work? Of course usually? they do. I mean, the, the prosecutor also, I mean, the investigators will often track them down okay. and, will, uh, and, will, and will interview them. And sometimes they can be subpoenaed if they're unwilling to give evidence. So I suspect uh, the, you know, uh, as the ball gets rolling, more and more of them will come forward, and more and more of them will, will give evidence. And as you can say, as you correctly said, there's no shortage of witnesses, and that is a most alarming fact in itself, because it suggests that Epstein, whoever he was and however he made his money, had this tremendous sense of impunity, which suggests very strongly that he was connected with all sorts of powerful people who he thought were, could, could provide him with cover. So, I mean, you know, they, w they should be going through all these, these people, getting their evidence and having them come forward and giving evidence at his trial. But the other reason we need a trial is it seems to me that it's only through a trial that we will find out who else was involved. And I come back to this question of his sense of impunity. Um, he must have felt that he had protectors, and we need to know who those protectors were. And if these protectors are implicated in this activity that he was engaging in, then they need to be brought to account also. And they may, need to be brought to account in the proper way through due process before a court of law, judged by a jury, ju uh, uh, with, you know, with a proper judge and a jury, coming to a verdict. That seems to me the only right way to deal with this case. And I'm afraid that, you know, shuffling it, shunting it all off to the Southern District of New York, which, of course, as we know, did a plea deal with Michael Cohen, which was then used to try to damage Donald Trump um, doesn't frankly suggest that what should happen is going to happen. The Southern District of New York has formed. 
Yeah, that's an excellent point with uh, Cohen, and and it's a cause for concern. Well, to me, it is. I, I, I mean, I, th- and you know, I, I don't, I don't think. I think it should be for most people. I mean, I, 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 I it's. Let's face it. I mean, the Democrats have themselves tried to involve Donald Trump in this thing. There is evidence that the Clintons were involved. Given that this is already a politicized affair. You don't want it conducted in a district where there's already been too much politics in the way that other cases have been conducted. I would have thought that's a very bad sign. Okay, so Alexander, in a case like this, is it plausible to say that if you have one witness that comes forth, it could be a very much a snowball effect? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's always the way it works. I mean, I, I, I've seen this happen, by the way, in these sort of cases. You see, people just, people find the courage. I mean, one, one must understand that these are very damaged people. Many of them are probably suffering from forms of post-traumatic stress disorder. They feel very angry, but they're very frightened, and they're too frightened to come forward. And remember, with Epstein being a billionaire, we, you know, going around on his jet, uh, with his flight logs all in the you know, open, with his pilots seeing what he's doing, with all the staff seeing what's going on. I mean, that also will have made uh, um, the um, the people involved, the victims, feel very frightened to come forward. If they see that one person is coming forward and speaking out, and is being listened to, and is not facing, um, you know, dire consequences as a result, then others will find the courage to come forward. And you can see an absolute, not a snowball, but an avalanche. I mean, um, everybody comes together, and suddenly this thing begins to uh, um, take a, a acquire a tremendous momentum. I mean, I, I noticed, by the way, that in one of your discussions, uh, where we were, you were discussing this thing, you mentioned Eyes Wide Shut, you know, the... Yeah, it's, Stan- like, the, it's like a... Uh, exactly, yeah, the Stanley... Eyes Wide the, Shut kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, the, the Stanley Kubrick right. film. And it does have something of... This thing does, at the moment, seem to have something of that sort of quality. But again, I mean, one of the things about that uh, uh, film was that it conveyed the sense of fear the coercion that has to be used to maintain silence in these things. Oh, you can buy silence, but that's never enough. You need to threaten people also. If the threat is no longer there, then they will come forward, even if they've been paid off. An important question which just came to my mind, and I was thinking about it today, is... Okay, so it's at it's it's right now the case is with the SDNY. Yes. And we know the history of the SDNY. Yes. But can you also is it under Barr's um, jurisdiction? Can Barr intervene, or or the DOJ, the office of uh, of AG Barr, to make sure that the SDNY is handling this case properly? I mean, is that does that make sense? Is this something that the yeah, DOJ no, I, can supervise to make sure that there's no funny business going on? You know, like, I, I, and I kind of think of like the Jesse Smollett case in Chicago where, you know, you yeah. had that deal made where he basically, he was one, you know, no, no doubt he was guilty, but, you know, they just kind of said, okay, a couple phone calls were made and, you know, he was let off the hook. Right. And I, I'm not as familiar, uh, I'm not sufficiently familiar with the internal mechanisms of the U.S. justice system to be able to answer that question definitively. But the attorney general of the United States is the country's senior law officer. He has a responsibility to see that the law is executed properly and that the Constitution and that the protections and safeguards set out in the Constitution are observed. I think it is inconceivable that he does not have the power to intervene in some way if this thing is going radically off course. 
And not only do I think that he has that power, I think he has the duty, indeed the responsibility, to ensure that the case is properly administered and properly conducted. Having said that, I'm not going to pretend that I know the exact mechanisms whereby that's done. And I must also say that I think that there might be political obstacles placed in his way if he tries to do that. What I think could happen is if we start to see growing evidence of a cover-up during the proceedings of the Southern District of New York, is more and more of these victims coming forward, more of the more of these people complaining that they're, uh, uh, what they're saying is not being heeded and that the case is being uh, uh, um, you know, suppressed and is not being conducted properly. At that point, those complaints reach the Justice Department, and at that point, uh, uh, Attorney General uh, William Barr intervenes in some way. But I'm not right. going to pretend that I understand the process I, well. I just pulled up because it came to, I remember it, I, I, was watch, I was reading it on Drudge, that Barr was not going to recuse himself from the Epstein case. I just pulled it up on Bloomberg. Let me read you the passage, Alexander, so you yes. can comment on it and we can finish up uh, the video yes. on this. Yes. Attorney General William Barr won't recuse himself from involvement in the new charges filed against alleged sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein by federal prosecutors in New York, according to a Justice, Justice Department official. Barr made the decision on Tuesday after consulting with career ethics officials at the department, said the official who asked not to be identified, discussing a sensitive matter. Barr weighed whether he would have to remove himself from involvement in the case, in part because Epstein had previously hired lawyers from the law firm Kirkland and Ellis LLP. Barr served as counsel to the law firm before becoming attorney general. Bill Barr has recused himself from any retrospective review of the Justice Department's decision more than a decade ago, letting Epstein avoid prosecution on federal sex trafficking offenses in Florida and the decades of prison time that he could have faced if convicted. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I think that seems perfectly proper to me. If I may say straight away, I mean, what happened decade, you know, more than a decade ago, that's obviously not William Barr's uh, a job to go back and review all of that, because as the head of the Justice Department, um, it's possible that he might be asked questions about that decision. So I, do, I think he might be a potential witness in it. But in terms of what other lawyers did, in his law firm, I, I don't think that gives him any reason to uh, um, recuse himself. I, I think, again, Barr has done the proper thing of seeking advice, but it's clear uh, and it seems to be logical that um, um, he should not uh, recuse himself in this case. I mean, I, I don't know this law firm, but I'm assuming that it's a typical American middle rank or big law firm. There'll be lots of lawyers there. He'll be one counsel amongst many. Um, um, usually, lawyers within law firms don't discuss their cases, especially these sort of cases, too much with each other because there is a concept of client confidentiality, after all, which is supposed to be observed. So it's the only reason why Barr would want to recuse himself or would be required to recuse himself is if he had been involved with Epstein in some way. And it in seems the actual he's not. case, you mean? Exactly, in yeah. actual case, or had some knowledge about Epstein, which meant that it would be inappropriate for him to be involved in it. Neither of these applies. So there's no reason why he should recuse himself. Now, the fact that we are hearing that he's not going to recuse himself confirms the, the point I made in answer to your previous right. question, that he does have some authority to intervene in this case, if appropriate. So I, I think, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think it's highly likely that at some point it will. And that's a huge distinction because you can make the argument that during all the Cohen stuff, you didn't have Barr around. You had a recused session. So the SDNY and, and 
everyone involved with with that Cohen case was just left to to run around and just you know well, do all kinds of kinds of nonsense. Now you're going to have a a strong AG and Barr. Well, well, this is exactly the yeah. point. I mean, Jeff Jeff Sessions. Let's be blunt about it. Was a terrible attorney general. And frankly, not a particularly good uh, uh, a lawyer. I mean, he was no great jurist. Uh, uh, um, um, William Barr is an excellent, is an outstanding attorney general, a very strong attorney general who's in full control of his department and a brilliant jurist. Again, I, I understand that many people are very critical of him because of certain views he expressed uh, 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 during the time of the George W. Bush yeah. administration about presidential powers. They do not detract from his brilliance as a jurist. And that is the only issue that we are discussing in this program. Yeah, uh, well put. Alexander McCurse, editor-in-chief of the Durant. Thank you very much. Guys, click on that subscribe button. Click on that like button. Make sure... You click on that notifications bell so you can make sure you get notifications when we do push out a new video. You can get an audio copy of this video. Follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. Don't forget to help us out and donate to us on PayPal, or you can subscribe to us via Patreon or Subscribestar. That also helps us out a whole lot. And the other thing that helps us out is going to the Durant shop and picking up a T-shirt or picking up mugs, a long sleeve like what Alexander is wearing in his undisclosed secret location. In my undisclosed <laughs> secret location, of which, however, I have sent you pictures. <laughs> they are on Instagram, the Durant the, underscore cops. With, you can with, see them with, there. With, with my two dogs yes. wearing this amazing shirt, which I'm wearing now with our beautiful Durant uh, uh, lo uh, logo there. You can see the double-headed eagle, which points to the east and the west, because geopolitically we cover both both parts of the world, both the east and the west. Our latest programs have been more, mostly about the west, but we cover the east to the same factual and careful degree that we cover the west. And as I said, this is a perfect T-shirt to wear in the kind of place that I am at the moment, which is I've been going a lot in the outdoors. Uh, near rivers, climbing hills, walking my dogs, walking with my wife and my father-in-law with my dogs and looking absolutely smart and elegant in this shirt with its long sleeves. And this it's all 100 percent cotton. And you can see how beautifully dyed it is. And it looks fantastic and phenomenal. Unfortunately, I don't have my mugs with me immediately to hand uh, for reasons I've explained. but. Uh, oh, wait a moment. My, my wife is providing them. Look, here we are. Here they are. <laughs> magic. There, are the there it is. There. That is magic. <laughs> there are the magic mugs. Exactly. You see that they've appeared out of nowhere. So we have mugs. This is this is my favorite mug. Again, with our double head, our, our own double headed eagle made from 15 ounce mugs made of wonderful uh, 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 porcelain body. Uh, um, um, enormously refreshing. Perfect for drinking tea or coffee or hot chocolate or even beer from. And this is our other, the other mug I have, which is, of course, the double-headed eagle, this time of Moscow, with uh, St. George on his horse, the Christian warrior slaying the dragon of falsehood uh, uh, and fake news, which is what the Duran does. But we have heaps of other mugs, lots of other amazing shirts. We have uh, a mug with the double-headed eagle, which is now the present Russian coat of arms. Um, and, of course, Mr. Putin created a sensation when he went to Osaka with a mug very like that one, with that very same double-headed eagle, the Russian double-headed eagle, and was drinking tea from it in front of all the other world leaders. And the international media got hold of it. And uh, the news, uh, the world leaders were obviously jealous of it. And there, there's photographs of him drinking from it. And you can drink from a very similar mug to that one with that very identical crest, the Russian, as I said, uh, crest, the Russian coat of arms. You can buy it from our shop. So uh, um, um, by all means, go to our shop, buy all these excellent things from it. Help yourself by owning these wonderful things and help the Duran also so that we can continue to provide you with deep and thorough analysis just like this. 
That's right. Pick up a magic mug and increase your geopolitical IQ by two, oh, three hundred no points. Phenomenal. phenomenal. <laughs> how else? How else can we do these things? That's and right. <laughs> these intricate topics in this erudite way. Exactly. Alexander Vicker is editor in chief of the Durant. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody. Take care.